We're going to hear from Eric Lamalfa. Eric is also one of the authors of the post-fire grazing brief that you just heard about, but he's going to talk about something completely different that he's doing as a Quinney doctoral research fellow at Utah State working with Dr. Kari Veblen. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm excited to be back at Utah State. This is my terminal degree. I was an undergraduate here in range science and I finished my master's with Ron Ryle in 2007 before working for the BLM and Forest Service. Um, today I'm going to bore you with a topic that's as far from the West as possible, uh, has maybe something to do with restoring the West, um, only in that I'm studying fire and grazing and how they interact. So hopefully this can be thought provoking and lead to discussions about how we can contribute to that uh, void of science in post fire grazing. So I'm doing research in Kenya in an East African savanna and savannas are a unique rangeland biome that is probably underrepresented in North America, although there are some in like the Shinri Oak of Oklahoma and Southern Texas, uh, Acacia. But anyway, um, they're defined by this co-dominance of grasses and trees and oftentimes they're unstable systems where grasses and trees uh, shift in dominance over time. Uh, much like bush encroachment that issues we're dealing with. Um, but early models of grass tree coexistence uh, keyed in on the niche separation and rooting depth between the two life forms. And so because water is available uh, at different temporal and spatial uh, places in the soil profile, that allowed for coexistence. Uh, more current models incorporate the importance of fire in maintaining savanna ecosystems and this is especially important in arid or mesic rainfall systems where you have 600 to up to 1600 millimeters of precipitation, trees potentially can become forests and dominate the system. But in these areas where drought is frequent, uh, they become fire prone and that's what keeps them as a savanna system. We know that braze, brow, bleh, browsing affects uh, trees, in, uh, especially in East Africa because of the diversity of wildlife species. Uh, little tiny things like this Steinbach feed on and have uh, large impacts on seedling recruitment and then larger browsing herbivores like Oryx and Eland uh, feed on the middle canopy things and things like elephants and giraffes can even impact large mature uh, fruit producing trees and elephants in particular can have dramatic effects because they'll often topple mature trees. Grazing also has a large impact on this co-dominance of grass and trees. Uh, wildlife again, things like uh, Grevy zebra and Cape buffalo are exclusive grazers uh, that eat herbaceous vegetation. And then there are also mixed feeders that are, you saw on the previous slide, they'll graze at different times of the year and they'll also browse depending on what's available. Uh, but the most pervasive grazer on the landscape, of course, is two-headed brown cattle. Uh, you can see in the lower corner. Um, but these uh, animals are able to exert more dramatic effects on the herbaceous layer because of animal husbandry, disease control, water distribution, and things like that. They're often uh, stocked at a much higher rate than the wildlife are. So when we put all this together, we have this giant mess of competition between life forms, disturbance by fire, and then different grazing and browsing regimes by both domestic and wild livestock. So what I'm interested in is tree cover and what controls tree cover is very important uh, in savannas as well as all these talks we've been hearing about in the case of aspen, we want tree cover. In the case of juniper, maybe we want less tree cover. So in the same way, uh, managers in across Africa and other savanna systems are very uh, interested in tree cover and its effects on uh, the availability of herbaceous forage, uh, which in the case of Africa is important for livelihoods and food security of the pastoral people that live there. Uh, so this is kind of how I'm approaching the, the subject, and this is maybe what relates to that post-fire grazing research void, is that we're looking at 
areas that have been burned and what happens to these trees that have been top killed by fire. Uh, trees after fire in uh, most savanna systems, the woody plants are re-sprouters. Uh, very rarely does it kill uh, these trees because they're adapted to these very frequent fire return intervals. Uh, so we expect um, that this recruitment, well, it's been well documented that uh, the recruitment bottleneck in savannas is not necessarily seedling recruitment, but it's when trees go from these small sizes that are inside the herbaceous layer, you know, less than a meter tall, to getting up above the browse line of those kind of medium-sized herbivores to where they can withstand the effects of fire. And so when there is a short fire return interval, these trees are often stuck in this fire trap cycle where they'll re-sprout, but before they can get large enough, they're top killed again. And they can be decades old sometimes, these tiny little buggers in the herbaceous layer, until there's a long period between fires when the trees can grow large enough to escape the top killing effects of fire. This has been referred to as the Gulliver hypothesis or fire trap. Um, so another way, before I go on, uh, another way that trees can get out of this is if they can grow rapidly. And so that's what I'm interested in, is how does herbivory affect that rate of escaping the fire trap uh, in these rangeland systems? So my two hypotheses uh, based on kind of previous literature are that mega herbivores and wildlife, and for the purpose of my talk, mega herbivores are elephants and giraffes. Uh, so mega herbivores and wildlife, which is all other ungulates, will have negative effects on tree growth, both height and biomass, and that cattle, through their removal of herbaceous vegetation, will have a net positive effect on the size of these resprouting trees. Although wildlife have grazers and browsers in the community, I expect them to have the net negative effect. And so I'm looking at two responses of the, uh, the trees. The first one is height, and obviously, uh, well, with the trees I'm dealing with, getting tall means escaping the fire trap. Once a tree's canopy is scorched, uh, it pretty much uh, above ground is toast. Uh, and then biomass, and the way I'm getting at biomass non-destructively is by measuring total stem length. So you can have a large or a taller resprouting tree on the left uh, that has the same amount of stem length as a shorter tree. Uh, and why this matters is that both trees have the same amount of biomass, and uh, we know from other literature that the faster a plant is growing after disturbance, the more likely it is to eventually get out of the trap, regardless of height. So I'm also, I'm working with a unique species of tree that's famous for this tree ant mutualism. There are four species of ants that have co-evolved. They're obligate tree species, so they only occur on these trees. The tree provides them with resources, and in exchange, the ants bite the crap out of anything that touches the tree. And the ants differ in their ability to defend the trees. There's too much to go into here. So for simplicity, I'm focusing my results on only trees that are occupied by the most aggressive ant mutualist, which is Chromatogaster mimosa. It's also called RRB because of the red, red, black coloration. And that's how people, when they're monitoring these things quickly, jot them down on data sheets. So I'm working in the Kenya long-term exclosure experiment. It's a long-term experiment set up 20 years ago. And basically, there's different factorial combinations of cattle, meso wildlife, and mega herbivores. And so where you see a different letter uh, here, that means that the animal is present in the plot. The zero plots are total exclosures that don't allow anything over 20 kilograms in under the fence. There's cattle only plots and cattle mixed with different combinations of mega herbivores and meso herbivores. The MWC plot being totally unfenced and uh, cattle included. Uh, oh, before I go on, all these little square dots are prescribed fires. So we conducted 18 prescribed fires, one in each plot. These are three replicated blocks of the experimental design. 
and we're monitoring uh, about 600 trees in those plots. So this is my uh, results. And on all these, you're going to see on the x-axis, this is tree height uh, before the fire. We know that the bigger a tree was before the fire, the more juice it has below ground, the more photosynthate to re-sprout. Uh, and so the further along this axis, the bigger the trees get. It's an important covariate in the model. Uh, the most obvious thing here is that when you take away all herbivores, the plants are the tallest. And this is a year and a half after the fires. The trees are about a half meter tall, so none of them are escaping the fire trap at this point. But this gives us an indication of kind of the direction they're going in. Uh, the next thing we see is the green line, and that's where the meso herbivores are the only thing present in the plot. So they're browsing on the trees and they're making them shorter. When you add in elephants, and I say elephants because the giraffes aren't going to stop and lean down to munch on these small trees. At least we don't have any uh, reason to believe or evidence that they would do that. Uh, but elephants nearly uh, half that height, and it really doesn't matter how big the tree was before the fire. Uh, elephants in combination with meso herbivores, I should say, are reducing that height quite a bit. Uh, when we add cattle into the mix, and we can look at the factorial combination of cattle with and without each of these different wildlife groups, we see that cattle really have no effect in the presence of wildlife. But where wildlife is excluded, cattle do have this slightly negative effect on tree height growth. This is counter to what I had hypothesized. And what I think is going on is that bef when the trees are first re-sprouting, uh, that they're, oh my, <laughs> uh, that when they're first re-sprouting, they're getting nibbled on by the, the cattle. That's what I think is going on before they have time to lignify the spines and uh, before the ant community recolonizes the trees. Uh, so this is looking at biomass, the same kind of similar pattern here, except that curiously elephants, the trees exposed to elephants for the last 20 years are, have a larger biomass. And although this isn't statistically different, I think that it is meaningful, and I'm gonna test this later this winter, I'll do some more burning over there. But I think what's going on is that the trees for per unit of above ground biomass, because they've been knocked over by elephants before, they probably have larger uh, below ground biomass with which to invest in re-sprouting. When we add cattle to this, cattle have no significant effect. There is kind of this, uh, yeah, a little bit of trend, but not significant. The branch to height ratio, um, this is kind of an index of whether a tree is more grazing tolerant or browsing tolerant versus fire tolerant. It's used to compare across species. Uh, a low number means fire tolerance, a higher number means browsing tolerance. And we see that these plants are kind of responding to that browsing, yeah, their morphology is changing and they're becoming more browse tolerant versus fire tolerant. So uh, to recap, we're throwing out the idea that cattle increase tree height. If anything, they decrease it in the absence of uh, wildlife. And we see that total stem length uh, decreases. So biomass and height are decreasing with the presence of these herbivores. So what does this mean for management? Well, wildlife affect tree height and therefore, and biomass, and therefore the escape rate out of that fire trap cycle. So where wildlife are present, fire return intervals might be longer and you'd get the same amount of escape from the fire trap. Where wildlife are absent, uh, there are gonna be faster rates of escape from that fire trap. Cattle have very little effect on tree growth, but they may affect uh, grass fuels and wildlife abundance. That's not part of my study, but that is one mechanism where cattle do affect that fire trap cycle. And so we're continuing to monitor these trees. This is two and a half years after the fire, and this tree is two and a half meters tall. So they are, uh, they're adapted to this top kill. Uh, and with that, I'll thank you and my collaborators. My advisor, Kari Veblen and Susan Durham, who helped me do some of these statistics and lab mates and family. And again, Ron Ryle, who, uh, yeah, 
he presented my master's data here uh, at the first or second one of these conferences nearly 10 years ago. Thanks. <laughs>